today. So a few words on the League today. So the League was founded in 1963. If you do a quick uh, calculation, you'll observe that we will soon be 60 years old, so this year actually. We're going to celebrate this and you'll be able to see on our website the different activities. Uh, in fact, to this, act this uh, conference is part of the activities. There will namely be an exhibit. So I encourage you to go check out our website. The League, so during these years, has aims to advocate and defend the uh, rights and, of, and that are invisibilized within the rights of the Charter. We have many activities, namely we intervene um, within um, organize, governmental organizations and we would defend human rights. And of course, as you may imagine, one of these activities is uh, disseminating information, raising awareness, education, and campaigns so that we can um, make known all these larger issues concerning human rights. So the League has been around for many years, but it's been for a few, the last few years that we've been, uh, or for many years, pardon, we've been working on for the rights of migrant people. So recently we've been supporting the campaign for the regularization of migrants and people without status. So in the summer, uh, and the fall uh, 2022, this support was also, uh, so the, the CTI and Solidarity Across Borders had a campaign that is uh, demanding uh, status for all. And as with such campaigns, the League has been supporting this campaign. And so we know that there's a momentum at the federal level and if you're you know, following the, the websites and social medias of these organizations, but also of the League, we're really informing and supporting these issues. We've also supported in the last few years mobilizations that have been done so that non-status children can go to school and that they can have access to public services such as health service, childcare, and access to public schooling. I also cannot uh, be silent on the fact that the League has worked during many years to work for the rights for uh, for the rights of caregivers. So we're, we've been part of a collective that presented a portrait of the life of caregivers and their rights. So and the rights of domestic workers. So. So domestic workers or caregivers are a great example of uh, migrant uh, people with precarious status that can lose their status uh, very easily because of structural rules. So of course, uh, for many years now, the League has worked on the question of systemic racism, which is obviously connected to the status of migrant people. The systemic racism is incarnated namely in different institutions that uh, treat migrant people. We can think of uh, immigration laws, uh, border laws. I think we'll have an occasion to speak to this this evening. Namely, uh, tonight we'll be addressing issues that migrant people are facing in Quebec. So it's a conference that has a very local focus while proposing a larger uh, criticism on a global level in which these, these struggles um, are part of. So we'll be, on one hand, be talk, looking at the concrete work um, that's happening on the ground and as well as the theoretical work behind the scenes as per our panelists. So we have Laurence Guinette will now present this to you all. On with this, furthermore, I, I will now encourage you 
to check out our website for our future activities. And I invite you to enjoy this evening. Bonsoir. Good evening. Bonsoir. Alors, euh, ben merci. Attendez que je trouve la bonne page. Je vais partager. Voilà. Donc, Thank you. Alexandra, moi, so, as Alexandra said, I'm Laurence Guinnet. I am been working at the League for about six months now. So, I have the honor of arriving during the 60th anniversary. So, I'd like to start by thanking you to have responded to this invitation in such great numbers. So, whether you're in person or whether you're uh, assisting over Zoom. So thank you to uh, accept this invitation to really deepen our uh, reflections and um, discourses on the issues that migrant people are facing. So I believe we're, we're starting to really be able to uh, identify these issues that people with precarious stat uh, statuses are facing. So people coming to Western countries, the, the, the violences that they're experiencing, the racism and that they're experiencing through capitalism. So these are all questions we're going to be examining tonight and really uh, how they um, interfere in major human rights. So there's many groups and individuals, namely the, the guests who we have here this evening, but also people in, in the room here that are uh, fighting for to offer services to migrant people who are, who are crossing or who are, are facing these uh, situations of human rights violations. So despite all this uh, struggle and, and advocacy for years, it seems this situation is not uh, getting enough attention, neither in the media, media spaces or political spaces. So that's really my, uh, what's, what's, what's my heart is crying right now. Why is it that we're not more scandalized uh, about these issues and more in solidarity uh, when confronting these issues? So we hear often about you know my, migration issues in the media. So often when when we are uh, planning this conference, we couldn't imagine at one point we would be um, holding this within such an incredible moment of, of, of crisis within the media. You know the opening and closing of borders, the ideas of, of building a wall, all these you know people yelling and and about different from different organizations that are that are so supporting people and welcoming people uh, with uh, precarious status. So on the provincial and federal level, there's a lot of brouhaha happening within the, the media sphere, but never we talk about human rights, at least not from the mouths of politicians. So no, we couldn't have imagined that we would have been at this very um, um, cumulative point right now. So we could not have also uh, predicted that during the, the holiday, uh, we would have had, had heard of, of the, the death of, of Fritz Nader Richard, a migrant who would, would passed away on the opening of Roxham Road. So we, our hearts go out to the family of, of Monsieur Fritzel. So for all these reasons, thank you for being here this evening. So as Alexandra has already said, thanks to our four panelists this evening we'll be able to speak of concrete realities and the state of the current realities that that can have uh, concrete consequences on these people here in quebec and in canada but we'll also be able to um draw larger global uh conclusions so hopefully these conversations will be able to nurture themselves equally so our panelists will now go deeper into these questions now so we have Samira Jasmin with us, Jenny Jeans, François Crépeau, and Rémi Paulin Tawira. And so also uh, added to these four panelists, we will have um, Oda Adra, a spoken word poet who is sitting amongst us this evening. We will hear her share and uh, present a, a very sensitive performance. And so really to welcome and allow you to enjoy this uh, artistic performance is to also allow us a moment of uh, sensitivity and emotion rather than spend a whole evening to just talk about these issues uh, that are heavy and weigh on our intellect. So it will allow us a space for for the feeling because it's it's quite a, 
a, a deep subject, an intense subject. So I will now uh, start to oscillate towards a few practical um, points. So first of all, we'll have two panelists for about 15 minutes each. Then we'll leave the stage open for Oda Adra so she can do her reading and spoken word. And then we will have two other panelists who will also present to us a little 15 minutes each. Following this, we will have a question period. So for the question period, it's uh, it's uh, certain that it will go by very fast and there's questions in person and virtually, so we'll have to limit these questions. So of course, uh, be ready for this. It'll be possible to ask questions um, at the microphone and also in written form for those of you online. And uh, it is certain that we will not be able to respond to all questions and we are so many people and we have limited time. Um, however, for the written questions, my colleague will have the, uh, the difficult work of, of choosing a few questions amongst the flow of questions to be read out loud. So hopefully these questions will be able to nourish our, our our thoughts on this discourse and we will bring them forward following this conference. So perhaps you noticed at the entrance of the auditorium, there is a table with material from the Ligue des Droits et Libertés. We have uh, works that we published. Uh, so last year we published a, a booklet that in, includes namely uh, a text from François Crépeau and a poem from Nadia El Taif on Rox Roxham Road. You'll also see the last issue of uh, Revue Relation. And so when we finish the conference, you may go and check out these resources. And of course, we invite you to become members, members of the Ligue des Droits et Libertés is a great investment in social justice and human rights. So for after 60 years, we've really uh, uh, crossed many obstacles and, and successes for and different struggles for human rights. So if you would like to be a member, you can go to the table and there's computers there and um, we have members who can assist you or simply you to register, you can you can start by becoming a, a member of our newsletter. So without further ado, I will now open the floor to Samira Jasmin. Solidarity Sans Frontières. Solidarity Sans Frontières. Solidarity Across Borders is a network of microjustice that has been active in Montreal since 2003, so for 20 years now. So Samira, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Before anything else, thank you very much for the invitation. I am honored to be here with you today to put the spotlight on a category of people that many of you do not know of. We will start with the impacts of the people uh, in precarious uh, immigration status, and we'll see how this affects their human rights and their living conditions and their dignity. We are talking of the people without papers. It can be a neighbor, a friend, a member of your family, and they become irregulars or people with no paper when their immigration process is rejected, either temp as temporary workers, uh, as ref with refugee status or students who leave their studies because of the excessive cost or family members that are abandoned because they fell ill. For many of these people, precarity starts as soon as they get a deportation date. They are in shock because they need to leave the life they have built since they arrived to become clandestine. They cannot rent an apartment under their name and often become homeless. And that is extremely difficult in winter as it has happened for many of our members or they are harassed by their neighbors and cannot denounce them. 
they don't have a work permit, they cannot work. If they do find work, they're exploited and paid under minimum wage. They have no access to health care to get treated, especially for the elderly who are more and more vulnerable. Their only option is Médecins du Monde, who, which is not a solution, especially for people with chronic illness. I also know pregnant women who have no idea on how they can get the care they need. They cannot send their children to school, although the law allows it until the age of 16. But what happens to these children after 16 years without studies or formation or training? It is to close all opportunities, and it is a fundamental right. People with no papers live in constant fear of being deported because there is an arrest warrant against them. No, they are not criminals. They simply fled poverty, colonization, and constant imperialism. And all this plays a huge role on their mental health on top of precarity and vulnerability. The fun, their fundamental rights are taken away, the right to health care, to study, to work, the freedom of staying or leaving. Their only mistake was to choose this country to live in dignity and with freedom. But the immigration system has transformed this right in a nightmare. Certain activists within Solidarity Without Borders are also people in a precarious status or without status. Our stru the struggle has taught us to fight for the right cause, to support the most vulnerable, to build our possibilities and to become efficient in an environment of collaboration and solidarity to be able to move forward, but especially to have the strength to face our fear. This shows us how to stand up when everyone is bringing us down, to say no to exploitation, to denounce abuse, and to tell our stories so that others don't go through the same thing, and to hold on to this dream of legalizing our papers and to scream loud that we want our fundamental rights, rights that each human being needs. We are humans, humans suffering within a society that ignores us. And this is not our fault, it is the fault of the immigration system. We are a family and we fight for one another when the rest of society will not do so. There are challenges, of course. We don't have nine to five jobs, precarity comes with uncertainty, and we try to fight together and we face the challenge of finding a time that we can gather to have time for this struggle is not a given either but even with these challenges we get together and this is what helps us to build our strength our slogan is the union brings the strength solidarity without borders has been active for many years and this long experience allows us to see the present trends when it comes to um, migration, whether uh, these are, are worrisome or positive. Solidarity Without uh, Borders is a network active in Montreal since 2003. Our main demand is no to deportation, status for all, and together to build a city without borders. Uh, when it comes to the present trends, let's start with the positive. At the international level, there are many things happening. For example, Ireland has given status to all people without status. There are countries who respect human rights and freedom of expression, but our country does not have that. There is no uh, freedom of expression. When we fight against uh, power, we are put in jail. During the pandemic, we saw a huge uh, nationwide campaign for regularization of immigrants. These trends give us some hope and give us the strength to continue to fight, to denounce abuse, injustice, 
and fight against fear. The fact that someone comes to speak during a protest and takes a sign to express themselves and show their anger is already a great win and gives hope to others who live in the shadows and in fear when we go out to protest against the deportation of a person and that we win our cause, that is also great hope when we are people in precarious situation without status and that this organization brings us together in these events and gives us a hand to support us that encourages us and that this fight made us into a great family although rejected by society in each call for action we find ourselves together and we win this shows that we collectively strongly believe that these fights can change the course of our lives and show that we fight against forced isolation depression and marginalization from the system when we are together in a protest that is encouraging and is a victory now the more negative aspects what has happened today in Quebec with Legault who says that refugees are not welcomed here that is very worrisome who the Quebec society has, has to say no to xenophobia and say yes to recognize the role that Canada has played in what has made us leave our countries why are there only the immigrants and a few people who fight to, to welcome immigrants safely and in dignity when Legault says that refugees are not welcome, that really worries us. We need to question borders and oppose all racist violence. Human traffickers, exclusion from healthcare and education, separation from our families and dear ones, lawyers who charge outrageous fees let's stop supporting this type of nationalism welcome to refugees freedom of uh, movement and freedom of coming back mobilization campaigns are essential right now and the public present to this conference should support and accompany a campaign for status for all the most important campaign to support now today is really a status for all on december 20th 2021 prime minister trudeau mandated the immigration ministry to set up a regularization program in canada in canada more than five hundred thousand people in canada are waiting for this to be able to live freely and I invite each person living in Canada to support these people and to awaken their human side. We can write letters into the newspapers. We can write to our elected officials, write support messages and send them to us, post on your social media, participate in our actions and protest and show your support to from your organizations by posting support messages on your different platforms. A true support from civil society means a lot. And also if you have the technical ability to make videos, contact us. Understand that each person without status has suffered a lot. Although I have to spend hours here telling you about the conditions they have suffered, I could not be able to describe them. I guarantee you that no one will have the patience and the endurance to overcome this situation without support. Your support will help them. A true program for regularizing the status and immediate stop to deportation, status for all. Thank you very much, really. Thank you very much, Samira. Thank you for everything you shared. Truly, I took note that that strength of uh, being able to stand up when you feel that everyone wants to just uh, 
crush you and walk all over you. That is really an incredible power. So thank you very much. We will now listen to Jenny Jeans. She is the detention program coordinator at Action Refugee Montreal, providing support to people detained for immigration purposes at the Immigration Holding Center in Laval for 17 years. She has almost 20 years of experience in accompanying and advocating for asylum seekers and those with precarious status. Jenny is very active at the table de concertation des organismes au service des personnes réfugiées. And she is vice president of the Canadian Council for Refugees. So Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for this great welcome this evening. It is uh, really great to be able to be here together in person. Thank you, Laurence, uh, for presenting me today. I'm wearing three hats. Uh, I am a frontline worker with uh, people detained for immigration purposes. It's uh, always very uncomfortable to say detention program because more specifically, it's a program a support program for people detained for immigration purposes at the Immigration Holding Center in Laval. And that is very long. So we say detention program, but it's really a program to accompany people who are uh, in this uh, situation of detention. I'm also very active within the consultation table of uh, organizations working with uh, refugees and immigrants. Uh, I think uh, it uh, regroups uh, more than 160 organizations uh, through the whole province, and most uh, of them tr work incredibly hard uh, these days, supporting asylum seekers uh, entering Quebec, many through Roxham Road, but sometimes uh, through other means. And the table was invited to send someone for this evening, and I was asked uh, as uh, the employee of a very active member of the table to come and speak not uh, uh, as a spokesperson for the table, but as, as an active member. For a few years now, since uh, 2017, we have a committee at the consultation table, LADAC, the welcoming of asylum seekers in Quebec, where organizations get together to speak of the challenges, uh, the difficulties we're facing, and to uh, try to find uh, solutions together. Finally, my own, my last hat uh, for all transparency, as you said, I am the vice president of the Canadian Council for Refugees, which is another organization that brings together more than 200 members uh, throughout Canada, again, NGOs, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, that accompany asylum seekers and people and immigrants in a precarious uh, situation. So those are my three hats. I was asked to come here to speak a bit more about the experience. And thank you, Samira. You really uh, said it uh, vividly for asylum seekers and especially those uh, working on Roxham Road who have become almost uh, puppets uh, today of uh, uh, the politicians. And it's uh, very sad uh, to see what is being said uh, right now in the media and in the political world when we're speaking about human beings and often children who are only seeking safety. So I'll talk about the situation of asylum seekers, but I need to also mention certain realities uh, uh, around detention. I can't be here with you tonight without speaking about uh, those who are detained. What I want to highlight are the contradictions that we see and experience in Canada, a country that says that it is a, a, a country of uh, rights and of the Charter of Freedom, and but and that welcomes refugees, but it is a country full of contradictions. And we really saw this today. There were many rumors circulating that there were going to be some announcements of closing the Roxham Road as a certain people demand. Fortunately, this was not announced uh, today, but we do feel that it might be on the way. 
And we were many frontline workers to be contacted by reporters today to have our opinion. I was contacted by another frontline worker and we are all exhausted, truly exhausted. And to have to explain that these complex situations to reporters just adds to the exhaustion. So Canada, country of contradictions. And when I speak of Canada, it is because most of the issues I will refer to are under federal competency, uh, access to asylum, detention for immigration purposes, and the refugee status. Although we are in Quebec, these powers are federal. So to speak about detention, a country who says uh, a country based on rights, but where detention for immigration purposes is used to detain asylum seekers simply because they don't have identity paid documents to arrive in Canada with a proof of their identity can bring uh, detention and treatments that are difficult to understand. For example, to be tied up, especially when these people are taken to hospital centers for care, we would chain their ankles. So it is difficult to understand this reality. A country also that, according to the law, considers detention as a last recourse for minors, but where children can be housed with their detained parents during many months and don't have access to school and are denied their freedom. And also a country who says uh, respects the Charter of Free Freedom and Rights. Uh, in 2012, implemented mandatory detention during six months for entering the country irregularly. This was, has not been used, but uh, the federal, the present uh, uh, federal government has never removed uh, that horrible power in our uh, laws and it could be used by the government because it does exist a government also who spoke of establishing a more human detention system but uh, that invests millions of dollars in new detention centers including the center that opened in Laval in October au système d'asile donc on a un pays euh, qui euh, peut être fier d'un tribunal spécialisé indépendant pour déterminer le statut de réfugié malgré la lacune qui est quand même reconnue dans le monde pour euh, donner une protection à beaucoup de personnes qui seraient pas reconnues dans d'autres pays et euh, où on a un taux d'acceptation qui dépasse euh, la, la moitié des demandes d'asile, c'est assez élevé. Mais euh, où, euh, dans les dernières années, pour contrôler les flux migratoires par le chemin Roxham, euh, le Canada a introduit des changements législatifs qui empêchent plusieurs à accéder à ce système reconnu dans le monde. C'est-à-dire que quelqu'un qui a revendiqué euh, le statut de réfugié aux États-Unis aura une demande irrecevable au Canada, c'est-à-dire ne peut pas faire une demande d'asile normale et entre dans une procédure euh, qui a des garanties procédurales beaucoup euh, plus limitées et des taux d'acceptation beaucoup plus faibles. C'est un pays aussi qui donne les points positifs, euh, comme euh, il faut nommer, qui donne une couverture santé aux demandeurs d'asile. Ce n'est pas tous les pays qui offrent ça et la possibilité d'obtenir un permis de travail mais qui ne finance pas les services d'accompagnement de demandeurs d'asile comme est financé pour plusieurs autres catégories de personnes migrantes et qui peut même euh, empêcher, prohiber les organismes financés pour les services d'établissement de donner leurs services euh, aux demandeurs d'asile. Donc, euh, comment une personne peut vraiment euh, s'établir dans la dignité si les organismes euh, n'ont pas les moyens de leur donner l'accompagnement qu'il faut. Je ne sais pas où est-ce que je suis rendue dans le temps, mais je vais poursuivre jusqu'à ce que vous me disiez de m'arrêter. Euh, 
Donc, euh, aussi... Il te reste cinq, il te reste cinq minutes. Cinq minutes. Ça OK. Oui. Je vais aller un peu plus vite, alors. Mais euh, aussi, un pays qui accueille quand même les demandeurs d'asile qui traversent à pied. Euh, il y en a beaucoup qui sont hébergés dans euh, des sites d'hébergement temporaire. Euh, mais euh, qui dit à tous les jours vouloir moderniser l'entente says that they want to modernize the third country rule. We're going to let people who are more in politics and strategies, but uh, so the government the, seeks to... So these people that are uh, seeking protection, they'll actually close the door to them. It's also a country that also accepts uh, many refugee people But the delay of family reunification is so painfully low that children are often left behind in countries, even after their parents have a recognized refugee status where na naming that uh, their country of origin is dangerous. And it can even be many years before, country, uh, before the children can arrive. We're also speaking to regularization We're hoping to have good news. However, we do have a law that says that people can refuse if they've um, really lost all recourse, then they must be expulsed as soon as possible. So for example, so if someone um, falls into the hands of a border agent, they, they can be deported very quickly, even within a few days, maybe weeks, even if the person Um, has to be uh, organize themselves uh, to have a dignified uh, leave departure that they can have quite a, a rapid expulsion even if they're working and apologies I have so much to say but um, I'll speak a bit of the this uh, agreement so the Canada Council for Refugees, Amnesty International, and the Canada Council of Churches, they have intervened in a, a case at the Supreme Court that it's now, we're now currently waiting on a decision to denounce this uh, safe third party agreement, namely because the U.S. cannot be recognized as a safe country for asylum seekers. If we do not ask for asylum within the first year on the territory, we can no longer do it uh, for afterward. And so people are then facing persecutions that are not recognized in the US. Uh, sometimes it can be a gender-based violence. Uh, Canada accepts more people on these motives than the United States. So we are waiting on this decision, but it's a bit strange that at the same moment that we are waiting on this decision from the Supreme Court, that could be quite uh, an important decision. The federal government, which could have um, ended this agreement after the federal court would recognize that uh, it's, it, they need to respect the, this uh, part of the charter, they, they, they could really end this and, and they really need to modernize it. So I'll share a statistic with you now. We're often talking about people entering through irregular entry points, but I've looked at statistics and the rate of acceptance just for people who are entering through irregular entry entrances, for some reasons that I don't quite understand, um, Uh, the tribunal gives stats specifically for that population, so it's for 52%, and for some countries it's 95%. So for some countries where the, the numbers are much lower, it's about 30%. So it means that uh, these are people who uh, correspond to international criteria of asylum seekers. So often if people don't um, enter into the definition of what is defined in the UN convention, it, there can be uh, dangers and factors that are extremely uh, intense that um, uh, will um, push people to leave their home countries and to, to immigrate. 
So forced immigration is, it's just uh, increasing worldwide. So Canada cannot um, shelter itself from these realities. So last word, uh, there, the administrative delay, we, we often speak of this in the medias uh, these days, the delays to uh, obtain uh, documents to be entered into the system, such as uh, work permits, they're extremely long. Um, luckily, uh, the federal government has been innovating a by creating tools and strategies to reduce delays to allow for work permits to be provided in a more timely manner however to accept, access these strategies we would um, first master the technology we must uh, master english and french we have to really understand bureaucratic processes that are quite complex and not everyone can do this and as i mentioned organizations are not financed to accompany uh, people within these with these pro procedures so if there's a certain feeling of chaos and disarray there are some solutions it just really takes accompaniment uh, a human welcome uh, you know humans that that are here not because uh, people uh, it, it, it's fun and frivolous to leave their countries but uh, it's, it's quite dangerous for people to leave I invite you to go watch documentaries on this we we call this uh, there's this one uh, called the Darien gap the 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 space between Colombia and uh, Panama there's many asylum seekers uh, who go through there before arriving to Canada and there's uh, rapes in the jungle. There's people who are um, are robbed uh, at, at gunpoint. There's uh, children who uh, came to Canada through this horrible journey. So it's really not a pretty situation. Uh, we really have an obligation internationally and morally on a human level to welcome all these people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenny. So I really feel that what you said, it uh, reminds us of this idea that's circulating that people who migrate, uh, they have the American dream, in this case, uh, the Canadian dream, but really, it's, it's false. People know how difficult it is uh, that they're coming through these uh, perilous uh, pathways, you know, they, they want to come with more dignity and they they want to come with more respect of their human rights so maybe this is an idea that we need to uh, combat and it's very frustrating you know when this image came out recently about uh you know dream uh, um, destination rocks and road uh, this all-inclusive it was really shocking to to hear that vision and thank you as well um in your presentation it really illustrated this phenomenon of dehumanization of migrant people, how it really um, inscribes itself within this detention complex and uh, deportations and so and this dehumanization. So thank you. As I said uh, earlier, I will now invite all, uh, all five of us to uh, leave the stage so we can hear Oda Adra. Oda is a multidisciplinary ad a poetess. She is uh, Lebanese and had, grew up in Saudi Arabia. Her poetry is very intimate and explores themes of family and body censorship and this the splitting of self and as a real consequence of post-traumatic stress disorder, amongst others. Her writing has recently appeared in the first collective work of Divers Syllables, her translations of Palestinian oral history testimonies in Voices of the Nabka earned her the Pen Translates Award. So welcome, Audra.
ici, mais pas là. Par où commencer L'inconnu me réveille tous les matins à 6 heures. Je reste avec lui quelques minutes, puis je me lève en lançant mon mollet gauche hors du lit. Le tour de mon bassin fuit et déroule mon corps à la frontière du matelas. En une rotation intérieure, mes orteils freinent ma chute. J'embrasse le vide, me repousse de lui. Une dernière demi-pirouette arrière, je suis levé. Je conserve l'équilibre. Je suis bocal et mon air nid chorégraphie la fermentation de ma journée. Tous les matins, pour me lever, je me fais tomber. Mes ancêtres ne sont pas ici, nul parent, de nul côté. J'ai une plaque tournante au milieu du torse en guise de cœur. Je ne sais pas vers où je vais pivoter pour l'amour du jour. Mon pays récède dans ses uns, dans ses héros. Mon peuple titube entre les deux, ne sachant plus sculpter la matière qu'il avait pourtant l'art de maîtriser par le subtil, par la générosité, l'hospitalité salvatrice, la chaleur dans les yeux. Un pays s'effondre-t-il vraiment quand son système bancaire, une entité invisible, disparaît Et il y a ces corps, toujours là, avec leurs fins et leurs orgueils, et ces besoins qu'ils font, et ces autres qu'ils ont, et auxquels le monde ne répond jamais. Et il y a moi, ici, mais pas là, propulsé par un voyage en rétrograde vers ce soi-disant futur qui occulte la contemporanéité de ma culture, qui me ment qu'elle a déjà disparu, et moi j'y crois quand je rencontre des Libanais de troisième génération ici, qui traitent l'existence du bled comme une donnée périmée, en n'en conservant que ces « chou yalla habibi » et des traits de caractère indéfectibles comme l'autoritarisme masculin et l'aigu du féminin. Comment réfléchir mon appartenance à partir du partir, à partir de la psy, à partir de WhatsApp et des wala de ma sœur qu'elle reproduit à rebours vers ma grand-mère et à saut de mouton de ma mère qui travaillait trop Rebrousser, c'est impossible. Alors on s'appelle diaspora, des sports du jour. On ne sait pas où on tombe aujourd'hui, même si on se lève tous les jours du même lit. Dia, ça veut dire à travers. Et je prends le bus et j'achète mes légumes et je travaille à insuffler de la matière à mon voisinage, mais les gens retirent leurs yeux comme des billes qui ne veulent plus jouer. Parfois par pudeur, parfois par timidité ou par respect, mais souvent, c'est que rien n'est assez partagé pour soutenir nos regards. Tout est ordinaire, mais rien n'est suffisamment commun. Alors, la trahison, elle-même déçue, nous transperce à chaque contact comme une écharde désincarnée. Ta peau me crie. Tu es ici, mais pas là. Tu inhabites la ville. Tu tisses dans des bâtiments que t'ôtera la, spécula la spéculation et ton regard flotte en échafaudage. Ma peau te répond. J'essaye de ne pas oublier les quatre lettres de mon nom. H-O-D-A. Ce n'est même pas comme ça qu'on l'écrit en arabe. Les lettres ne sont que trois. H-D-A. Et le O, c'est un son entre un O et un O. Il n'existe même pas en français. Et on l'inscrit comme une lettre miniature suspendue sur le H. Et on l'appelle un signe diacritique qui veut dire séparé, à travers, entre et dans différentes directions probablement deux, puisque dit. Et donc, et donc mes yeux scrutent le vide pour laisser assez de place à ce haut de trop, grand comme mille passagers arrière qui gigotent, les genoux coincés dans l'espace du frein à main, alors que je slalome dans le glissement du souvenir contre ce paysage conçu par une mairesse montréalaise, bergère de vélo, qui sait profiter du présent dans l'optique d'élaborer le futur. Et mon absence n'est écrite nulle part. Et tu crois qu'être là, c'est avoir un corps. Et tu crois que me voir en est la preuve. Et tes croyances s'inséminent à partir d'un système sans ressenti. Je continue le, te le texte, en fait. Euh... Oh. 
Le texte que j'ai lu, euh, c'est le nouveau début de ce que je vais vous lire, qui est paru dans ce magnifique ouvrage collectif euh, qui s'appelle « Il y a des joies dont on ignore l'existence » de la maison d'édition diverses syllabes que je vous encourage fortement à aller vous procurer dans toutes les librairies. Vous, vous lirez plein de voix euh, énormes ici euh, que vous avez besoin de lire. Donc, euh, je vous encourage à le trouver comme c'est vraiment unique comme ouvrage. Aujourd'hui, si tu venais chez moi, tu ne verrais rien de libanais. Aucun fruit, aucun légume, aucun mésé, sauf le petit bol constant de zaatar mélangé à l'huile d'olive. Aucune grenade, aucune nefle, aucune figue, aucune mûre, aucun cabis, aucun navet mariné pour près, aucune moulerie ni une seule bémier. Je ne suis pas un concombre libanais du Québec, ni ton hummus aux mille et une couleurs, ni le chichtaouk usurpant le shawarma. Je ne suis ni immigrante, ni exilée, ni apatride. Je suis profondément amovible. J'ai un jasmin chinois au-dessus de mon four qui survit mal. J'ai un œil bleu grec au-dessus de ma porte qui protège pas mal. J'ai des corans parsemés partout dans la maison, deux autour de mon lit, un sous mon oreiller, un dans la cuisine, un autre traduit vers le français par Jean Grosjean, un du côté du lit où personne ne dort et un tout en haut de la bibliothèque parce que le Coran, ça va toujours tout en haut. Je ne fais pas mes cinq prières, mais je fais mon wudu pendant la douche du soir pour protéger mes rêves. J'entame tout par bismillah, dis merci par alhamdulillah, espère par inshallah. J'ai déjà lâché la patate pour le bacon, mais mon Coran ne cherche pas à me punir. Ce sont les Corans des autres qui me trouvent des failles. S'il y a une chose que je sais, c'est que Dieu insuffle toutes les formes, même les plus amorphes. Je l'aperçois dans le doré du feuillage, l'entend dans le bruissement du métro, l'éprouve dans la solitude de mes repas vaincus. Mon Coran me demande de lire et Dieu me dit de garder patience, quand en vérité, le temps vrille, mais on le vit au ralenti, un carrousel de cailloux dans la tension de la fronde. À 17 ans, j'explose. J'éclate du bout de ma tête et je sors par mon cou comme un coca. Le ciel s'en trouve. Je fais le tour de la voie lactée, trouve suspendues les poitrines de toutes celles avant moi, de grosses planètes pleines de lait pour les âmes qui quittent leur viande, du lait de sommeil qui te donne l'air éveillé, mais ton pouls bat au minimum, du jus de fantôme pour des musulmanes qui n'oseraient jamais. Parfois, sans faire exprès, on peut le tenter par le ramadan, d'autres fois par un régime imposé si on est une jeune libanaise enrobée. Parfois, entre body image et religion, on peut se mélanger. Au Liban, certaines disent bonjour par « tu as maigri » et d'autres te disent que tu as grossi par « comme tu as maigri, et d'autres encore, pour maigrir, observent le carême ou le ramadan. En Brumanie, hein, Brumanie c'est un pays que j'ai inventé en fait, mais qui existe, mais pas vraiment. <rire> c'est un pays recouvert de brume. En Brumanie, certaines cachent leur corps pour se rapprocher de Dieu, et pour se rapprocher du ciel, d'autres éradiquent leurs égaux, et pour une purification totale, d'autres encore pratiquent le jeûne. De même, Montréal propose un certain anéantissement de soi qui contribue à ressentir le poids du vide. Un jour, pour me remémorer mon existence ici, je décide de jeûner le ramadan. Mais dans l'extrémisme de mon isolement, j'oublie de manger mes iftar. Je maigris de six tailles, mes jeans, des parasutes sur mes fesses. Une seconde avant ma mort potentielle, j'ai enfin le corps de libanaise qu'on m'aurait voulu. Mince, trop tard, je n'en veux plus de ma forme ni ses menottes d'amour, ni ses culottes de cheval, ni ses côtes de libanaises qu'elles aiment ériger comme des montagnes russes. Ailleurs, on dit, la chair, c'est trop sexy, et les os aussi. Tu es juste comme tu es. Mais moi, je vois la libanaise migrer ses fesses dans ses joues pour attiser l'homme, et ça m'effraie. Et je vois la brumanienne retrousser son corps contre son gré pour apaiser l'homme. Elle n'a plus d'organes, juste une cape comme taguée par un dieu mâle, et ça m'effraie. Alors j'explose, je me quitte comme un cerf volant et je flotte, amovible, au-dessus de al Madina, Al-Sahra, Al-Quds, au-dessus de Tripoli et des bajoux des Libanaises, ces bankers à Baklawa. Comme une gazelle fusée, je, je fonce jusqu'à ne plus voir que le grand océan, qui n'est jamais zète. Comme Pégase, je vole jusqu'à concevoir la source de l'eau, comme Boulak, plus vite que l'éclair. J'atterris à l'aéroport, les douaniers ouvrent ma valise et trouvent la Kébé, en forme de disque avec les losanges tracés dessus que ma grand-mère m'a fait trafiquer. 
Elle tentait la quadrature du cercle quand elle a démembré un mosaïque. Les deux bonhommes se disent encore l'arabe, sa viande et son kéchec. Et pour cette connaissance pointue de mon patrimoine culinaire, je leur donne un A+. On fait quoi, Johnny Brûle-moi ça, Bobby. Brûle tout. Dans cet intervalle de distraction, la valise en césarienne, ce n'est pas la Québec qui a filé en douce, c'est moi. Je suis tombée sans elle comme d'une jument. J'ai rampé comme un lézard. Je suis arrivée au Québec comme un foulard perdu, arraché par le vent. J'ai pris sa forme et tout ce qu'il m'a assigné. Troqué ma cape noire pour une soie rose. Je ne sais plus à quel instant mon corps et moi avons bifurqué, mais j'ai continué à flotter. J'aimais l'air. Merci beaucoup, uh, Oda. Je suis certaine que... Thank que... you very much, Oda. I'm sure uh, that everyone shared the joy I felt uh, listening to you and following your words. We went through many amusing and moving moments through all that. Thank you very much. It was beautiful. So following this refreshing interlude and poetic interlude, thank you very much again. We will now give uh, the floor to Mr. François Crépeau. François is a full professor at McGill University's Faculty of Law and holds the Hans and Tamar Oppenheimer Chair in Public International Law. He has extensive expertise in human rights issues affecting migrants and served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants from 2011 to 2017. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. It is uh, difficult to speak after three uh, presentations that moved us, uh, that really touched uh, the emotional fiber that goes with uh, being unrooted and uh, immigration and might seem much more rational and won't be as moving, I apologize. But I would like to offer an analysis of uh, the limitations uh, that put us in a, an impossible situation that uh, continues. The first thing I would like to say is that we are all migrants. Who in this room lives today in the birth city of their four grandparents? Is there one hand raised or two? They're, they're, often are a few, but it's generally less than 5%. We are all migrants. The largest migration of the 20th century has been the rural exodus and the rural migrant going into the city was treated poorly, country bumpkins, as we say. Borders historically have never stopped movement until the 19th century when uh, identity papers were invented because they were afraid of anarchists. We started uh, blocking borders a bit. This uh, happened mostly at the end of the 1920s and 1930s. And again, since the beginning of the 1980s, after the oil shocks of the 70s, uh, the beginning of the 80s, inflation, Um, unemployment at the end of the 70s, and their politicians closed the border saying, well, there will be no more immigrants, so there will be less unemployment. At the time when Jean-Marie Le Pen said, two million immigrants, two million unemployed. And math that is absurd, but that is still what we have in mind. And we considerably reduced immigration back then. If I not mistake, in 1982, permanent residents, uh, new uh, permanent residents, uh, 500,000. And we were down to 6,000. 
and they wanted to make, have us believe that it was the immigrants fault it's very easy to blame them there was a criminalizing discourse towards immigrants but all immigration states both in the north as in the south it is true also of malaysia and south africa basically eliminated official non-specialized labor programs if you're a professional if you have social capital if you're a, an engineer you and they don't call you an immigrant in those cases they call you an expat the consequence at the beginning of the 80s meant an increase in asylum demands we went from 600 to 60,000 10 years later. Why? Because it was the only way to stay. It's not because people before the 80s didn't have the need for protection, is that they didn't need to ask for asylum status. They could ask for a work permit or a residence permit. And the immigrants come here. Why? They come to build a future, a future for themselves and for the children. That is the objective. There can be different reasons and a mix of reasons often. Certainly violence, poverty, the difficulty to find employment, the difficulty to pay for health care for the parents, to finance education for the children, to build a new room in their house. There are many reasons for immigration and they're very complex. And not everyone has the courage to take this journey. And we also have to talk about what isn't often said is that migrants aren't dumb. They go to countries where there is a possibility for a better future, where there is, are jobs, because in the host countries in North or South Canada, United States, Malaysia, South Africa, there are millions of employers who are willing to hire migrants under the table, exploitation, etc. But migrants come because they know there are jobs available. No one is starving in Canada or dies of starvation. All immigrants with status or without find jobs. They find local solidarity. It works and employers know this. And leaders, political leaders also know this. We closed the borders with Schengen in Europe after the events of September 11th. The United States uh, uh, brought upon a huge movement of security uh, with immigrants. They were a threat. We closed the borders. We built walls with movement detectors, infrared cameras, integrated border management systems, uh, control of the borders and transit countries. We gave boats and all sorts of technology to Libya. The United States finance uh, the control of the southern border in Mexico and all these mechanisms, uh, as well as the safe third uh, country agreement, uh, are numerous. The financial and symbolic investment at the borders is considerable. And they tell us that borders stop migrants and it has never happened in history with maybe the small exception of northern korea borders are porous and especially political borders we won't stop migrants migrants will come first of all because they need to come second of all because employers here want them to come if we have a need for mobility on the one side and of labor on the other side and we put a, an obstacle in between what are we doing we're creating a clandestine market if governments don't give the possibility to mobility others will do it and it'll be traffickers it'll be the money lenders the also housers employers recruiters those people will create a means to get through the border clandestinely and they will exploit the migrants who came in often with papers but these papers are expired or their asylum request was denied these exploitation systems are created by state policies 
This didn't exist before borders were closed or very little or very little before the borders were closed at the beginning of the 80s. From the 50s, 60s, 70s, you could enter Canada pretty easily, enter Europe, millions of North Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans uh, entered Europe, uh, millions of Mexicans entered uh, the United States, found jobs, uh, got a word permit, lost it, got went back to Mexico and back into the States. You could move back and forth, it was possible. Since we closed the borders, we created an impossible situation that we can't manage 40 years later. And so we built for these migrants, so whether they have status or not, or they're temporary migrant workers with a single employer, very often we created a system of precarity in which exploitation is possible. Migrants have a considerable agency if they are able to survive their journey all the way here and to survive in hostile environments, but they can't express it publicly because they were put into a built precarity. Without any other options, the immigrant without status, and it's the same for temporary migrant workers, have to accept working conditions that citizens would never accept, would never accept with the conditions offered to migrants. We often say that the migrants do the work that citizens don't want to do anymore, but we forget to mention that it is under the conditions we offer them. But if we offered tomorrow $30 an hour to pick strawberries, many Quebecers would go and do it. Maybe we'd need to go to 40, but there could be a labor market that would work. Yes, the price of strawberries would be very high, and that's one of the issues in all this. Because migrants invested so much in their migration, their survival, they have obligations towards their families in their country. Many sent money, they want to build a future for themselves and their children. And so they are afraid of being arrested, detained, deported, failing, and having to go back home empty handed. And it is this fear, this fear and this created precarity that causes this fear, this fear that doesn't allow them to speak out. And this fear then makes them silent. They protest very little. They mobilize very little collectively. There are some efforts to mobilize, but it is difficult because of this fear of being seen and recognized. They don't join unions. There's an issue when it comes to unions, especially local unions. It's difficult to mobilize them openly. And we face then a system of indirect uh, uh, subsidies to these employers who exploit them because of this created precarity. In sectors impossible to delocalize, that's where we find them. We delocalized all the manufacturing sector to other countries where labor is cheaper, but we delocalized the working conditions for the sectors that can't be delocalized. You can't delocalize agriculture, construction, healthcare, domestic work, hotel work, restaurant work. All these are things that cannot be delocalized. So we found ways through this con created precarity in economic sectors with a low margin of benefit. And for a temporary migrant worker, if we have a single employer, we are afraid to be banned for the following year, not be able to come back and work and finance your children's studies. So this is a cycle that perpetuates itself. And sociologists have been talking about this for 30 years. We know that this is built and created. We know that it is a system that works. There are tens of thousands, if not millions in Europe or North America that are immigrants who are exploited and we don't do anything about it. We don't do anything because migrants do not vote. And in, a, in an electoral democracy, the politician, and we can't blame all politicians, but they work according to elections. The first obligation of a politician is to win their elections or they can't do anything. And if there are citizens who demand things, they'll listen, but migrants cannot vote, so they cannot demand. 
And as citizens, we have so many other issues when elections come. We have taxes, we have schools, we have the holes in the street in Montreal, we have the healthcare system that worries us, healthcare for our parents, etc. We're not going to vote on immigration laws that don't affect us directly. The only electorate that can be mobilized ideologically around migration are those who are opposed to immigration, unfortunately, and all the politicians woo them. Immigration policies are then established by non-migrants, politicians for non-migrants, their electorate. At the time, like at the time where policies for women were established by committees of men, they had no idea what they were talking about and it didn't matter at all because they weren't speaking to women and we're not speaking to immigrants today we're speaking to citizens and so we have immigration policies like at the time of the committee of men based on myths on fears on imagination that truly do not re respond to the needs of the immigrants or the employers we know that quebec employers are demanding a hundred thousand immigrants per year so it doesn't answer their needs either why because we have an electorate that can be mobilized and who bases their ideas on myths supported by politicians because it helps them get elected. And the migrants don't bring into the public sphere a reality check. Women have had the right to vote for 80 years in Quebec, longer in many countries. And it's only a few years ago that they had the ability to have a Me Too movement denouncing sexual harassment. Migrants don't even have the right to vote. They're not even there yet. So we need to think about that. We can get back to it during the question period. Another type of politics is possible and it was established with the International Pact for Immigration signed by many countries on the planet, including ours, that mentioned 62 times in the text that we need to facilitate movement, the opposite of what we're doing. And amongst the norms cited, we need to adopt regular migration paths in order to improve movement of labor. So to add visas, migrant categories, and at all levels. Faciliter le regroupement familial, garantir un travail décent, ça veut dire appliquer le droit du travail, aux migrants. Les inspections du travail dans tous les pays que j'ai visités sont incapables de protéger les droits du travail des migrants. Et ça, il faudrait euh, y penser. Mais aussi la régularisation, et je termine avec ça, dans le pacte mondial, c'est dit qu'il faut faciliter la régularisation des migrants. Et je pense que cette, cette idée, et je pense que les États ont raison, ils ne l'appliquent pas, mais les États ont raison, il faut I think that we need to facilitate regularization. We need think about what happened in the 60s and 70s. There was no catastrophe. It wasn't a problem. You were rethinking the world. I do have a lot of hope uh, for future generations, but I have absolutely no hope for my own generation. I believe that we are incapable of seeing the strength of this diversity and we're uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. We're not uh, benefiting from what migrants could bring to our society. So there will have to be a future generation to do it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, François. Uh, Thank you so much, François. Thank you for this intervention on constructed precarity and complicity of, governan of gov governance and employers. So this, this way of, you know, we want them to be there, but we don't really want them to exist. So this idea that we want to open the borders to circulating uh, merchandise and uh, capital, but if it's humans, ah, it's another story. So it's a very uh, important uh, connection you're making concerning this constructed precarity. So uh, referring to this non-engagement um, and development of this work. So our last uh, 
Our person uh, panelist is Rémi Paulette-Tahirwa. He has been involved in migrant justice and anti-racist groups on Turtle Island for the last 10 years, and more recently in the United Kingdom where he lives. These involvements and his experience as a Rwandan refugee has informed his reflections and positions on this outsider question. And this is what he is studying for his PhD in the London School of Economics Sociology Department. Oh, so my participation today is more in a, a theoretical framework. So thank you so much for this uh, for an invitation. And I really appreciated these intervention. It really is nurturing my own uh, discourse. So I thank you for doing this uh, free work for me. So uh, today, what I wanted to uh, talk about with you is to really talk about this concept that I named uh, a planetary disinheritance. So this is what I'm working about in my PhD. I'm working about migration and uh, human rights in the United Kingdom. And the second half, to really, um, really talk about a more global context, I'm interested in the notion of hostile environment that's more um, known in the UK. So I'm really um, uh, relying on this, this context and this notion of hostility of which we have discussed today. And this last final uh, section will be putting the accent on what I consider to be an opposition between the state and the migrant figure. Uh, I'm talking about this in sociology, so I put it in air quotes. So, so as we have said, it's a, it's a construction, it's a construct. So even if we use this term in a popular language, it's only recently that we've started introducing it in the public discourse. So, so the first uh, part, I'm going to read a little bit. So because uh, we've had years of experience to do this type of uh, work. So it's, it's common to think of the planet we inhabit as, as a heritage. So by virtue of our birth, the territory in which we find ourselves becomes ours, generally through biological affiliation, so right of blood, for our presence on the territory. So this form of belonging is also a form of inhabiting the planet. It's, uh, but both are not historical processes that can be linked to the emergence in Europe of the nation states and on other continents with the colonial state. So this form of belonging and inhabiting is the result of a vast European project aiming at ordering the planet through capitalism and colonialism. So colonial um, frameworks uh, are part of what uh, Carl Schmidt named the hummus of the earth. So it's a system of division and distribution of land. So this ordinance of the land is not a question of um, distribution of land, it's, it's a planetary question and is a work of appropriation. And it's namely uh, a force of that's generating truths, a generating a force of truths. And it's namely a question that, that the state notably calls what on what it is to be human and, and what the state intends to be to govern. So sorry if I'm, I'm not uh, pronouncing his name right, but in his book, Define and Rule, Mahmoud Mamdi was able to show exactly how colonial authorities, so in this case, the British Empire, launched a, a vast project of fabric to manufacture certain political identities through racial and tribal categories so, you know, within uh, especially uh, British India. So, so namely uh, the distinction between natives and settlers. So in his book, Home Rule, the Canadian uh, sociologist Nandita Sharma focuses on the same processes, or she, she focuses on the same process. She suggests uh, that the state has uh, produced the figure of the migrant. Sharma's analysis shows, however, that there's a particular semantic reversal in the context of settlements such as Canada, where the native uh, came to qualify the descendants of European settlers who were later called citizens. This is explained in part by the need to ensure the legitimacy of the depossession of the territory, and which we now call the colonial state of Canada. So on a, in legal terms, we're, you know, we're usually thinking of uh, what Canadian citizens means, who are in fact the settlers of, we're settlers if we were on this land today. 
To be clear, what is important to emphasize in both these works is that the power of the colonial state to define how to govern and inhabit the colony. So the distinctions between settlers and natives and you know, are really necessary, or, and later between natives and migrants are necessary, especially in a colonial context for the governance of populations. So I'm gonna borrow from Malcolm Ferdinand's formulation of, uh, he calls this the colonial inhabitant, which he defines as the existence of certain humans and their relationship with other humans, so non-colonists, uh, and their ways of uh, coming back to, to these islands. So according to Ferdinand, colonial inhabitation has three principles. The first is that, is, the opposition and subordination of the metropolitan inhabitation. And finally, it, it's based on the exploitation of resources of nature, in short of what we, uh, Ashin Mbembe calls the combustion of the world. This last principle is particularly important because it shows that the real objective of the colonial project is above all the transformation of human, animal and vegetable life and various non-organic components into matter and energy. So to come back to the notion of no heritage, the form of belonging and inhabiting the planet in the form of inheritance hides in reality a form of disowning and disinhabiting the planet that comes under what I call for the moment, uh, for lack of a more precise term, uh, this word, uh, planetary disinheritance. So, uh, so this term that concerns us, you know, uh, it's this act of uh, dis, uh, disembodying or disinheriting uh, the world. So it comes from as it would be benefited from in a colonial state. So from a, a hostile environment to a hostile planet. So in 2012, um, Theresa May, uh, who is uh, serving as Home Secretary, introduced a new policy, which its goal was really, uh, which was called that the aim is to create a truly hostile environment for illegal immigrants here in Britain. So is this called this hostile environment policy? So it's, it was a series of measures designed to force the voluntary return of illegal immigrants without indefinite leave to remain. So this policy, along with 2014 and 2016 immigration laws, so they de facto delegated the verification of immigration status to various public and private actors, including landlords, community organizations, the NHS, banks, and even employers. So in fact, these actors are now responsible for verifying the immigration status of any people uh, seeking access to their uh, service. So uh, in practice, this translates into an increase in de deportations, particularly because the UK has made the application process so complex that even policies that wish to reinforce this hostile environment, include, uh, including the new Home Secretary, Swola Braverman, are not sure uh, not at all sure how to make a proper application. So more concretely, I'll use my own example as an international student. Uh, I must submit a report to my university uh, every semester, which is confirming the progress I've made in, in completing my doctorate. Namely, it includes the number of meetings I've had with my research supervisors. In the case where I could not submit such a proof, the university uh, must, in fact, report to the Ministry of the Interior that I'm not attending university and I could have my visa revoked. Of course, in my case, I have the privilege of my Canadian citizenship, but you must understand that this hostile environment has become a reality that affects thousands of people on a daily basis and has led to hundreds of people being unjustly expelled from the country, including the wind rush generation. What interests me about the notion of hostile environment is not only that it exposes uh, this racism, you know, and it, which of course uh, targets racialized people, that has been, you know, concentrated by the state in the border institution to produce the foreigner, this other. It's also because this notion allows us to see more clearly how the state's power uh, to define it's intimately linked to its power to govern. So, in short, there are these different categorizations between legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. There's legal and illegal people, basically. When we abolitionists say no one is illegal, it's precisely to challenge this vulgar and dangerous assignment by the state to certain bodies. So often bodies that are dominated by a triptych of gender, race, and nationality. I say vulgar because it is, above all, a lack of imagination.
as uh, Francois said, you know, uh, you know, we're taking up this this old fear of the stranger by associating it with criminality and danger. In Canada, we speak of national security, and it's this term is used to detain and deport thousands of people. In Quebec, we appeal to anxieties, also ancient. These fears linked to or that are linked to the fear of the extension of a small people. And I say this is danger because this legalistic assignment of some, if, if we, you know, stop and we, we think about it, it's, it's also, it's really a, um, a migrant hunt and it leads to a lot of suffering in the world. So we're, we're really going from a hostile environment and progressing, progressively moving to a planet, a hostile planet. So we're seeing uh, this worldwide tendency for people to, to limit the presence of these people on their territory and even to prevent their arrival by all means. These attempts uh, to, to attack any form of solidarity between honest citizens and citizens are being threatened by, by prison sentence or fines if they facilitate their entry. So for example, there's there's even this this decree that would punish people who would be helping uh, migrants uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So really, we're we're seeing that the the the, the this prevention is uh, caused the the death of, of thousands, and this has been happening since 2014. Finally. Uh, the return of the the wall in this imaginary fortress is is really a, uh, a technology of control that's a manifestation that's a, the most a visible manifestation of this hostility. And I will now uh, conclude. So to conclude, I want to come back to the notion of of truths of the state and this ex and this concept of social magic at work uh, with the border institution. So, namely, um, you know, on one hand, the state needs to determine certain truths about itself, its mode of functioning, but also as such as admission processes as well. In reality, I, I mean what Bourdieu calls common sense, that's pr as a product of the state. That means um, if we take for granted our social reality as it were, it, it's a field of struggles between several actors, including the state, to impose their truths in the uh, political and social imaginary. In the case of the migrant, again, in quotations, it seems, however, that this, this common sense is partially uh, put into act. However, you know, it's, it, it's like a, it's, it's like a, a, in contradiction with the state. Among these, the uh, contradictions, the border as an institution to which a social function is attributed, but also, as Baldur said, is a, it's a social fiction. And it's the field of struggle between the state and the migrant, not only because the border has come to concentrate a variety of powers, including economic, political, and symbolic, but also because the border in institution plays a key role in the production and governance of social bodies and various capitals that are at stake when the state establishes, not to say prescribes, its truce. One of these truths that we, we know, but that we prefer to ignore, is the fiction of the border. So that's to say that it's, there's a kind of fetishism of this imaginary, but no less real line on which rests the difference, since its primary function is that, to produce the foreigner, the other, the non-citizen, or more recently, what we call the migrant. So, you know, again, what, um, as the anthropologist Keshar Vas and Hosravi uh, note in Seeing Like a Smuggler, they say the smugglers, the illegal, the uh, illegality of an activity and one who performs it, namely the smuggler, actually allows for the revelation and appropriation of the state practices or fronterization. So uh, certain practices uh, and in that are classified by the states of the global north as illegal then appear to us actually to actually respond to violent practices and systems. So to conclude, these two anthropologists, um, they actually propose to us to reflect on how people, um, their, their, 
they're they're proposing like what they call like a, a counter magic namely um this this idea of uh sharing and coexisting on land so so this idea of counter magic is is these alternatives that allow us to live in an alternative realities so this 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 social counter magic of those who reject the fiction of the border also offers the opportunity to think more seriously about more equitable and less violent ways of belonging and inhabiting this planet together that would not be based on the appropriation of nature and disenfranchisement but on bringing our planet into relationship so you can't accomplish these fundamental changes without a certain dose of folly and this precisely comes from this anti-conformism to turn our back on old ways and the courage to um, create future pathways. And I would like to be one of these crazy people. We must invent the future. Merci, Rémi Paulin. On entend des, un fan club dans la Thank salle. Thank you, Rémi Paulin. We can uh, hear your fan club in the room. It was incredibly interesting, uh, especially this concept of hostile environment to bring in the perspective of what is happening in the UK to show what is starting to be put in place here and that we need to fight against. Uh, and also this reference to lives transformed into a material um, that uh, touches on what Mr. Cripo also mentioned. So thank you to all four of you for your amazing presentations. I think we started from Samira showing the interdependency of the human rights and how all the impacts are connected and create a machinery or interconnected impacts. And then to go and look at all the different policies that are implemented that cause a situation of precarity and then to go towards the concepts uh, that uh, Francois and uh, Rémi Paulin presented of this uh, created precarity and of the uh, of a hostile environment. And so it was really good to have your four perspectives together here this evening. So thank you for that. And I think that it uh, proves uh, the importance of a human rights perspective as the basis for all immigration policy. We have to look at uh, the foundations on which uh, these policies are based uh, today or the premises they're based on and go uh, to the end of these analyses that you present and that it be something we hear in the public uh, space, the link with capitalism, with racism. I think all this needs to be said and heard and maybe the future generations uh, will be uh, up to the challenge. We'll now open the floor to questions. Donc, so, for the question period, we have uh, about 50 minutes uh, left uh, in this event. For those here in the room, we'll take the questions. There are two microphones. There's one here and one there. And we would ask you to limit your interventions to about a minute. I know that it's very brief, but seeing the number of people we have in the room and online, we're trying to limit ourselves to be able to hear as many of you as possible. For those who are online through Zoom, you can send your questions in the chat. And there is a colleague uh, who will be able to uh, uh, select uh, these questions to ask them here in the room. And for those who are listening to us uh, in English, uh, uh, feel free to ask a question in English if you would like to. There's uh, absolutely no problem. Also, to, I apologize in advance if uh, we don't get to all your questions. I think that seeing uh, the wealth of information in the presentations and the uh, 
gravity and the interest of the issues we're looking at today. We apologize in advance because our time isn't unlimited. And of course, uh, the question period isn't the right time to bring up individual cases because we won't have enough time for that. So we'd invite you, of course, also to ask your questions in the perspective of respect and dignity, of course. So these are the little guidelines I wanted to give for the question period. Do we have anyone in pa our panelists that can also ask questions if uh, you have any? So is there anyone here in the room or on Zoom who have any questions? If I see people at the mics, I'll understand that there are people in the room who would like to ask questions, but we can start with the Zoom. If you'll allow me, I'll ask a question that came on the Zoom. Someone would like to hear more on this notion of uh, social magic, seeing that it can be used as lies or fiction. So if you can say a few words about that and then we'll move on to the other questions. Yes, in fact, uh, this is a term that comes from Pierre Bourdieu when he speaks of institutions. He says that institutions create social fictions. In fact, uh, he says that they have social functions that are, in fact, uh, social fictions. And so he uses this term social magic. And then I mentioned a book called Seeing Like a Smuggler by two anthropologists. I don't remember their name right now. But they also use the term to speak of the borders. They have a text that they call the magic of the border or something like that. And in fact, the idea is to show that like in magic, there's a trick there attracting our attention on something. There's something going on with the other hand, right? So it is that metaphor of magic that they use in their texts and that I, I presented here. I didn't create the notion, but I use it as inspiration to show that as we spoke, borders are a pretty recent creation. Why were they created? There were reasons behind that. And one of them was to control the mobility of populations from the global south. The UK, amongst many, or the British Empire from the very beginning used borders to control the movement of workers in the colonies. So that's the origin of uh, this term, the borders as we know them uh, today. That's the use uh, that they're given. So it's to show today how it's a myth. We spoke of myth also. It's an important myth uh, in our society today. I could add that it is extraordinary and to me that's the, the the idea of magic but for 40 years now uh immigration ministers in the countries of the north say that they'll stop illegal immigration once and for all and each minister says this and then they say vote for me because i will end illegal immigration joe biden this morning announced that asylum seekers will no longer be able to enter through the southern border if they entered irregularly they can't present an asylum request they'll have to do it on their phone through an app before they get to the border and if they did not seek asylum in a transit country they won't be able to seek asylum in the united states there's some magic in that concept because that's not the way it's going to happen but many people will vote for that Thank you. Yes, here, the, mag the uh, uh, link between uh, practical magic and more theoretical magic. Thank you for the question. I'll take uh, three or four questions in a row before we uh, come back to our panelists. So here. Good evening. My name is Nasrin Besani, and thank you very much for your presentations. They really complemented one another and highlighted the importance of the uh, interconnectivity of rights. And it brought me, I really like that uh, Rimi mentioned the, the quote of uh, Thomas Santas of uh, uh, the initiatives of the madman, because it is uh, impossible to imagine ourselves uh, doing something, especially uh, in Mr. Kribo's presentation, the 
you bring up the fact that we don't want to pay $30 for our little basket of strawberries, but those who pick the strawberries work under working conditions that uh, I, you sh we think would not be here in Canada, it would be impossible to do only that change, right? So what I was thinking when I heard that we spoke of colonization and how can we work maybe solidarity between indigenous communities and migrant groups to a bit change the framework in which we we reflect on these i am an immigrant i am now a canadian citizen but if i don't do anything i become an accomplice to the colonizer. So how can we uh, reflect about this as immigrants, as citizens, uh, to find solutions together? I don't think we'll find an answer today, but to continue into the folly of the madman, how do we expose uh, these uh, issues? Because it seems to come from all sides. Michel Pilon, General Director of the RATMAC, the network to support immigrant workers in Quebec. And I really found myself in what Francois said, we defend migrant agricultural workers. And just yesterday I was at 2460, where we pay four times less Mexican workers and Quebec workers. And we need to denounce the working conditions of these workers. And so I ask myself, myself serious questions about our charters, the Quebec Charter of Rights, the Canadian Charter. How can these be tools to help us to eliminate the closed uh, uh, visa work permit, for example, that is modern slavery, seeing that they cannot work or offer their labor to other uh, employers? And that is a huge issue. And that's what I call modern slavery today. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, another very interesting question. Good evening. My name is Geneviève. I am a second generation immigrant. And I also wonder about the role of people in a position of privilege if they don't want to be accomplices of an oppressive system. In particular, as was said, linked to the exploitation of migrant workers or uh, migrants without a status, do, are we seeing with an increase of natural catastrophes, uh, an increase of this uh, human trafficking, of this exploitation, and how can Mobilizations demand more rights for these workers without putting their status in danger. I last a question from uh, Mrs. Pierre here before we go to our panelists and then we can go through a second round of questions. Thank you very much for these presentations. Thank you, Rimi, for having uh, cited uh, Malcolm and uh, the colonial inhabitant. And I think it brings me back to Nesrin's uh, question of how we uh, we uh, all together live on this earth and the power relations that exist in this colonial habitat and the possible solidarities with uh, indigenous communities so thank you for that but my question is this idea or this implementation of a hostile environment in the uk what have been the resistance movements? What can we learn from that as citizens, but also as groups who defend the rights of migrants? How do they face this hostile environment? How do they resist? And what can we learn from their work? Thank you. Really interesting. So I'll, I don't know who would like to take the floor. There were many very interesting 
topics on the table, uh, the uh, idea of solidarity with the indigenous uh, populations, how to face uh, and fight exploitation or charters and all that, and what can we learn from uh, this uh, hostile environment policies? I could maybe answer very quickly on the question about the charters and how can we ensure to have rights that exist on paper be respected. I heard of France, I've heard Francois speak for many years of the importance of the courts, but in my daily reality, people who are asylum seekers uh, without status, have a very limited access to legal representation when it comes on all the issues of natural justice in a legal aid system that is really not well financed in the sector of immigration in other sectors also but it's even worse in immigration so to have the rights presented as they exist within immigration rights, but also to have the charters be applied concretely is extremely difficult. And I've had interns, law interns work with us that have noted that in criminal law, there are more and more many more guarantees given because there is much more legal fights so there's really a difficulty uh, to concretely have access to natural justice. So if I can add to that, just on what you just mentioned, the immigration rights are administrative. So we uh, made it a security issue and we use criminal law language when it comes uh, to immigration, and the specialists call this crimigration, mixing the two words together. So what we've done is that we've used institutions established for criminal law, and we've introduced them into administrative law. But administrative law was uh, uh, the right of uh, fishing permits, of contracts with the government. It wasn't dangerous. It didn't establish uh, guaranteeing the right to defense or things like that. But today, the only judge in Canada that can send someone to torture, to arbitrary detention, and to extrajudicial uh, execution is the immigration lawyer without wanting to, but they're the only judge that can do it. And we haven't in administrative law evolved the guarantees that criminal law got to after many centuries. And there's an issue there, and the states know this. These guarantees uh, of proof in criminal law to protect the innocent, we prefer to have 10 guilty men, uh, guilty people uh, free than one uh, non-guilty one in, in prison doesn't apply to immigration law. So to the question, what can we do? Something that really strikes me is that in all the fields of governance, governments do strategic planning when it comes to infrastructure to build a highway, a Highway 30, let's say, has been planned for 30 years, maybe not exactly where it will go through, but it is planned when it comes to energy. When it comes to urban planning, where are we going to build a new neighborhood? Where are we going to put the school? Uh, environmental strategy now today. How will we uh, protect certain environments? We do 30, 20, 40, 50 year strategic planning. And in all governments, there is a unit or many that do this. In immigration, it doesn't exist. Immigration policies are always decided today. We need IT people now. We need to deport the immigrant today. No one asks, how many immigrants do we want in 10 years? There's no debate around this question, or in 20 years or in 30 years. The first indicator that there's something that might be changing, Statistics Canada, I think in the fall, forecasted the Canadian population in 2060, 49 million people. 
this tells us that there might be something to debate there. Where will these 10 million new Canadians come from? They won't come from the babies we're having because we're not having many, but they'll come from immigration in a large part. But what does that mean? Can we talk about that? Who will we bring in? How and why? So for mobility and for the diversity of our populations, we need to do strategic planning. And this means an important social debate in which we invite the most interested people, the immigrants, so that we can debate with knowledge. But that isn't done anywhere right now. But I think that maybe the next generation will be able to do it. Rémi Paulet or Samira, would you like to answer to one of the questions? I would say that the civil society can help the non status migrants in their process. The support is the great benefit for them to be able to overcome all the obstacles. In fact, on the question of the hostile environment and the resistance movements, uh, yes, uh, the people do organize together, as we always say, people resist facing uh, these oppressions. So there's all sorts of different uh, types of resistance. One of the examples I find uh, incredible are the anti-raffle committees. Uh, these are uh, neighborhood groups uh, that work together that so that when the Home Office sends trucks uh, to pick up people and deport them, people block these uh, people and don't allow them to uh, bring people into forced deportation. So these when these agents went into the neighborhoods, uh, often they've had to give up because people uh, organized in the neighborhoods and protected uh, the community. As Samria said, the state really wants the victims of these policies to feel isolated. And I think that when solidarity is shown in, in the media, amongst other things, because the reporters come, they take pictures, you can go into the Guardian. There was a, a phenomenal picture in Bristol, I think, where there was a whole neighborhood that got together and blocked the deportation. To this idea that the people don't have their place in the neighborhoods and that they have a value and they need to fight the system on their own. Another example, par exemple, de plus en plus, même s'il y a des, ce que j'ai parlé de more and more, although I spoke of Italy establishing this decree, but more and more organizations and individuals accept to take the risk to go against the law, in fact, to save lives, because that's what we need to remember. It's about saving lives that we're talking about. And uh, these people organize and are able to save lives, even with the danger. It's not this romantic idea of going to save lives, but they understand the risk they're taking. They organize, and there's a camp uh, right now uh, a case right now the supreme court in italy of two activists uh, uh, who were arrested because they tried uh, to save uh, lives uh, in the mediterranean sea and also to come back to the, the question i think we also need to think about especially in the book uh, uh, seeing like a smuggler we uh, Les passeurs, en fait, sont vraiment, uh, um, so actually, um, uh, people coming through are seen as enemies of the state because it allows for a lot of uh, people to... So in this, in this book, the primary argument that they're making is that these people are essential to ensure the, the safe passage of people who are forced to use the networks. So when we create systems that uh, prevent people from coming through, then the, the experts who are able 
uh, who can support to say which which uh, roads are safe, which are not safe. So when we when we really uh, throw this discourse on its head, then it's well, so so smugglers that were uh, bringing uh, people like the Soviet citizens out of out of the Soviet Union, they were they were uh, treated as heroes. They're celebrated. So French resistors, uh, English uh, aviators, and homosexuals from France. Um, so smugglers that were bringing these people into France in the Second World War, they were saying that those smugglers saved the honor of France. That is not what we're hearing today. So there's a question of perspective in the way that we're uh, presenting this uh, social magic. Uh, I'm, I'm loving this term now. Uh, so we've created this myth that is, is deeply grounded in this idea of criminality. And the and it, more we repress these people, more there's capacity for exploitation. And that is the, the fault of the states. If you, uh, if I may, so, you know, when there's uh, questions of borders between Mexico and the states, they've created a, board, uh, a border wall. And because there's places where the wall was not able to be constructed because of the, the train. So it forces people to converge towards more difficult and more uh, precarious uh, and perilous um, uh, pathways. So I think it's very important to pay attention to this. So in, in the hope that it will dissuade people from coming, and it has never dissuaded people, this is the truth. This idea of dissuasion keeps coming back in political discourse. There is no sociological support to say that uh, borders or will uh, really put a, a, a stick in the wheel of people seeking asylum. So um, when you thought I was uh, getting agitated here, it's because I wanted to see if there's questions on Zoom. So perhaps we could take one now. So there is many of them. So I will ask the following, which country, which countries are uh, exemplary and could inspire us, perhaps even just one? And there are questions concerning this question of, just a moment. What would a victory at the Supreme Court imply uh, regarding the safe third party uh, agreement? So there's a question addressed to Jenny. There are other questions as well, but these are the two uh, primary questions. Thank you. Uh, we could now go to the other microphone. So there are five people currently. We'll try to go through all five of them and then come back to our panelists because it, uh, it is a lot of subject matter to address. So I would like to give my opinion, but it will uh, end with a question. So to really uh, uh, come back to, to your, your subject, uh, I'm against the wall. It would encourage only um, encourage criminality and and really, it's a business at the end of the day. Uh, their smugglers will just profit off this, and they make uh, money off of people trying to get through. And, and people who can't speak English or French can be exploited. So you can ask them anything if they don't speak the language. And I'm against this wall, but I'm asking more than 80% uh, of illegal immigrants come through Roxham Road. So how do we, how do we say, how do we verify who comes in the country and who, because understandably we have to be honest. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's important to know who is coming into the country. There are more than 30,000 uh, migrants who uh, have come to Canada illegally since the beginning of the pandemic, and there is no verification of these people. So what happens is that on a legal uh, front, certain people can be uh, deported because perhaps they've uh, caused crimes or other things uh, in the same 
logic. So how do we how do we create a selection or criteria of who can enter or not? So next question. Good evening. My name is Love Joyce Amavi. I would like to speak about Roxham Road and also about uh, this question of social magic. Why am I speaking of Roxham Road? Because I went through there myself. I've written a book about the subject that's called I Did Not Choose to Leave. And uh, just to uh, respond to this, uh, uh, Madame, it's, it's an irregular entry point, not an illegal entry point. It's so we get to Roxham Road. Oh, the microphone cut. Apologies. No, that's not. Okay. So what I was saying is that we arrived to Roxham Road to uh, seek asylum um, because we have no other choice and everything is verified. Our footprint, our fingerprints, our, and our antecedents, everything. So when we arrive at Roxham Road, everything, all of this is uh, verified, but I, I will let the panelists uh, speak to this, uh, you know, we call it illegal, but it's irregular. So my question now is uh, concerning the social magic of borders. We'd like to know how does it work? So to to do something, uh, I believe uh, it's uh, Francois. You were saying it's up to a next a future generation to do the work. But my question is. If borders of our states that are um, well-known entities, uh, you know, uh, with concerning questions of sovereignty and integrity with laws, what do we do if there are no law, uh, no borders? If uh, borders are pure magic and we try to abolish them, then what next? Uh, without these frontiers and the context in which these uh, states function and their prerogatives and everything. So I just to better understand this. Thank you and uh, good evening. My name is Abdelrahim Hussan. I am an activist in a human rights organization in the Canada section. I am a member of uh, the Ligue des Droits et Libertés, not active yet. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, panelists today. Really, what we're observing uh, currently concerning immigration, it, it becomes more and more complex. It's not just a question of laws. Now, uh, states and governments are really turning into uh, totalitarian, totalitarianism. So, for example, if we're talking about Italy, uh, I can give two examples. It's the same thing. There's uh, sub-Saharan immigrants that arrive in the north of Africa, either through uh, from Maroc or Morocco or Algeria, and and thousands of them coming from either the desert or the Mediterranean. And so, the convention of European nations and that they have with the north of Africa. So Morocco has a convention. So they will they'll play so Morocco will play the role of the of the police officer. They'll they'll block the immigrant. And then and then this 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 person will have to go to Nador and which is just a few uh, kilometers away and so this is this is a mechanism then through this convention. Uh, they, they give they give uh, the right to the Moroccan government to play this role actually so for example um, in in England there's you know there's there's immigrants that are there uh, in a clandestine way and and they you know they arrive in England and they are asylum seekers 
But if people are refused, they can be deported to Rwanda. So they have that agreement. So my question now is, for can North American uh, countries apply these same mechanisms here? I will take a last question and then we will uh, go to our panelists. Good evening. My name is Mamadou Sore. I come from Burkina Faso. I'm informing you that uh, uh, that, uh, that this uh, Thursday there is pe uh, people will be exhumed and they will be reburied where they were where they were killed. And Sankara in my country was saying uh, concerning immigration that his, his people love other people and that normally. We can live without borders. The right to immigration is a fundamental right that we must protect. Because uh, in man is always uh, is when we're talking about the rights of immigrants here, I see a choice. When people leave as immigrants, it's not a choice. Uh, there's the, this phenomenon, this, this, these factors that, that push us to leave. So, so amongst these factors, there's the violation of basic human rights. So, the current Burkina Faso that I'm speaking of right now, it, it's one of the places that has the, the highest number of displaced people in the world. And because of the question of natural resources, and very often we find Burkina nationals that are involved in the exploitation that makes that finally this access, problem of access to resources uh, forces people to be displaced. And us, uh, as, as the Ligue of the Trois Liberté, you know, and we're considering the universality of human rights, you know, how can we do to respect these going forward? But at least, So, at least to to address this idea of forced displacements. So you have uh, quite a, a large breadth of questions to choose from. So again, I'm not sure who would like to go first. So I think we could start with this question of social magic. And she said, uh, this this woman said, oh, about 80% of people went through Roxham Road to get here, and it's not true. So 80% of people came legally through uh, the road and, and were refused. So I think this other uh, 10 people came through Roxham Road. And they do this to distract our, our gaze from the regularization program. They want everyone to be concentrated on Roxham Road and to forget all this. So, so really, everyone must support this program. It's, it's the solution to all the problems for any irregular people here in Canada. So really, it's important to, to not distract our attention. So maybe I will answer this question on the safe third party agreement. So there was a contestation at the federal level against this agreement and the federal court, the judge declared that, yes, there was a violation of the Charter of Rights and uh, Freedoms the Canadian uh, Charter, so it was unconstitutional, and I believe it was Article 7 and 15, because on one hand, the danger was really well uh, proved that people who were uh, stuck in the US would be facing, and coming to Canada would be facing persecution uh, without even being able to have the opportunity to uh, ask for asylum, or because 
um, the, the question of persecution would not be recognized. And then there were questions of abuse that were very well documented as well that led to other proofs, uh, other evidence that was very vast. So the federal court then did find that it was in a violation with the Charter of Rights and Freemans, but the Canadian Supreme Court went in to uh, uh, brought forward an appeal and they reversed the decision on a technical point. And so now it's been brought to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court could say that the agreement does not uh, stand its ground and they could end this safe third party agreement, something the government, the federal government wasn't ready to do. But often these are things that happen and we have experts, uh, legal experts here. So maybe the government will try to, uh, you know, even if they have, uh, they, they quash this, this agreement, they might uh, find another agreement to replace it with new criteria and new articles. So it's, uh, it's rather unknown uh, what, what the outcome might be. So to come uh, back to this question on Rocks and Road, uh, thank you so much. And I, I can't wait to read your book. So um, absolutely, they are irregular entry points. And this uh, asylum seeking is uh, well anchored and well protected in international law and in Canadian laws that a person can enter, whether it's through an, a, a regular or irregular route to seek asylum um, in any circumstance. So just the right to ask. So people who come to ask for asylum, they might not have uh, made uh, in-depth researches on articles of the law and international law. Will they be recognized as refugees or not? There are so many human reasons uh, to to experience a forced immigration. So an uh, an ironic part of this um, Roxham Road uh, mechanism that has been put in place by the RCMP and the CBSA is that these people are extremely um, uh, investigated, verified, researched. I see some that are detained. Uh, after coming through, if they're missing identity papers, it could include pregnant women, uh, children, precarious people, solely on the reason for the reason of missing identity papers. So to keep this mechanism, this imperfect mechanism in place, it creates a very regular system of irregular entry points. So we don't hear a lot about this in the political debates. So I. Uh, I will end here. I don't know if there's other questions I could have answered. Is there an exemplary country? No, there's no such thing, but there are exemplary measures taken in certain countries. Quebec is one of the few jurisdictions in which the children of um, Parents uh, without status have access to school for five years uh, now, and uh, they have access uh, to health care and school. We didn't give this to pregnant women or their parents, but that was the first step, let's say. We need to celebrate uh, the small victories. It's very important for, pe for them. Canada, the program for Syrian refugees and U the Ukrainian refugees right now is an example with the EU is doing for Ukrainians. Uh, they was put in place a, a program that existed, but all of a sudden, five million Ukrainians in Europe is not a crisis, but uh, the same thing with the Syrians before was a crisis. So if we plan, if we plan in case of crisis, we can plan things so that it's not a catastrophe. It's not easy, but it's doable. Spain regularized at least 800,000 people about 15 years ago. Colombia, Colombia gave a Venezuelan citizens and there are a few million right to work, social security, etc. So there are countries who do some good things uh, that we can use uh, as inspiration. Roxham Road, irregular entry point, but migrants don't want to be clandestine they would much prefer to be able to 
enter with someone and that's what they do at Wrexham Road that they present themselves to someone from the RCMP and what do they do they say well I'm an asylum seeker and then they enter a process if we close Wrexham Road what will happen it'll be done uh, uh, elite, e through the forest uh, with uh, uh, smugglers now we know exactly who enters for, uh, through Wrexham Road it's not ideal but it's much better than clandestinity. And to me, the question of investigating and seeing who might be security threats, because there can be some in that population, including it as in any other population, including in this room, we have to do what specialists call security intelligence. It's not immigration that tells us about security no it's intelligence who might have spoken about a, the uh, an operation and this and that what they want is information on people they don't want immigration statistics that doesn't interest them now about the borders you spoke of eliminating borders it's not a question of eliminating borders borders are very useful for many reasons when we cross the border between Quebec and Ontario, all of a sudden the road is of much better quality in much better state. It's very simple. There are reasons of zoning, uh, financial reasons. There's a border between Montreal and West Mountain and it exists uh, uh, mostly for removing the snow, but borders do have their reason for existence. And we can have freedom of movement where there's, uh, you can move from one province to the other in Canada, except during the pandemic, maybe. Uh, we could have a system like Mercosur, where an Uruguayan citizen that goes to the Argentinian border and says, I want to enter Argentina to work, receives a residency permit and an working permit because they decided that there was a freedom of movement for work between the countries of the south of Latin America. You can't just enter without saying anything, but you go, you present yourself and you receive a permit. It's simple and much more efficient, both for the state, for the person, for everyone involved. The EU is developing by investing in immigration security systems of the countries of the global south and they've used development funds to transfer computers speedboats to uh, find people trying to cross the mediterranean in libya for example they strengthen repressive uh, uh, regimes in many countries is that truly development so there's really an issue there of uh, uh, transparency of policies and finally what can we do as civil society because of my the mining industry amongst other things first of all in canada we can push the government to impose Canadian mining companies' obligations around human rights, labor rights, workers' rights, etc., for their operations in foreign countries. And we should allow legal cases when these are not respected. The Canadian government hesitates because we are a huge mining company with huge mining company companies. So there's work to be done there on what these mining companies are doing in other countries. And that's a very sensitive topic in Ottawa because there are a lot of taxes coming in because of that. It's a Canadian expertise. So there's work to be done there. We need to push and demand that. We could also push our human rights organizations to actually act. The Human Rights Commission did one report on immigration on temporary migrant workers, and they suggested to end these work permits, a single employer, and then they were hushed hushed by both levels of government that said this is immigration it's not human rights don't 
get involved. And since then, I don't think they've done anything. I haven't seen any report uh, on immigration at uh, the Human Rights Commission uh, because there are many other things they can look at without uh, um, getting a finger wag. So we need to push for these uh, uh, mechanisms to do the work. Would you like uh, the last words in two or three minutes? Yes, in fact, I'm an abolitionist, so I don't believe in borders. So we have a divergence when it comes to that, because I think that the question is, what do we do then if we don't have borders? Abolitionists, when we're asked, well, like, what do we do without the jails or without the police? We need to ask, what does police do? What do jails or prisons do? What are, do borders do? Gilmore says that it creates a premature death. People exposed by border violence, violence of prisons and police are exposed to a premature death. So I think that instead of asking ourselves, what do we do? What would we do without borders? We have to look at what borders are doing right now. It hasn't solved any of the global issues, we fact the issues of climate crisis, the issues of the redistribution of wealth. One of the reasons why borders, why the states in the north invest so much in the building of borders or building up the borders is because we live in a finite world with finite resources and that these are distributed unequally. We, we buy our cell phones with materials that are extracted in Africa without the consent of the local populations and the exploitation of African populations. So we want to ensure a certain comfort and lifestyle. That's what borders ensure. The maintaining of the inequalities on the planet. That's what I like to tell people when people ask, well, what do we do without the borders? We have to ask rather, what are the borders doing right now? There are many examples. We also spoke of the fact that borders are recent. It comes to from colonial times and many of these, the borders come from the colonial empire very few or none of the present societies right now are more than 50 percent of the borders come from colonial heritage and they don't necessarily represent the way people live there are cultures beyond borders of families that live across borders or divided by borders so we also need to think about how this is a recent institution that hasn't solved any of the issues quite the opposite. They seem to amplify them and ensure inequalities. And there's a question on the externalization of borders. I find that that's a worrying uh, phenomenon. I haven't spoken of the Rwanda plan. It's a plan that the UK has and now that anyone who crosses the border illegally is the term they use. They want to automatically send these people in detention centers in Rwanda, which is quite ironic because being a Rwandan refugee, I left Rwanda with my family because of a conflict. And now to see the country I fled participate to this program or this project with the UK really makes me uncomfortable personally. But we need to understand the position of countries like uh, we mentioned Morocco, Rwanda, Libya, the countries from the north are paying these countries to detain people. So it's a capitalist exchange and economic exchange between countries of the north and the south. It's not the population who will get the benefits from this, not the population from Morocco or Libya. It'll be the local elites that will really uh, get the fruits of all this. Uh, so the externalization of the borders, that's why I also use the concept of uh, a hostile planet. It's because we're exporting this hostility to the global south right now. And then that's the danger. People more and more are stuck in situations where there is uh, no plan to 
come and help them and i'll end on this uh, the exa exemplary countries no there are none there are groups uh, who work uh, in different countries uh, like the anti-raf uh, uh, committees and i uh, there it exists in montreal but the visits and detention centers also uh like solidarity without borders uh, does also ensures a solidarity uh, with people in the detention centers and in society so these are just a few other examples i wanted uh, to mention thank you very much thank you to all four of you Thank you very much for these uh, great questions. It's a, it was a nice uh, conversation. It was very interesting to hear you uh, speak on the different questions. So this ends our evening. Again, thank you to our four panelists and thank you to Oda Dara for the beautiful uh, artistic performance uh, earlier. So thank you also very much to the consultation table of the organizations at the service of refugees and immigrants for their support organizing this event and also the Caisse Economie Solidaire. Thank you also to the interpreters from the Largo Co-op that allowed this evening to also happen in English. And thank you to all the activists of the 60th anniversary committee of the Ligue des Droits et Libertés and to all the team, the permanent team here that did all sorts of things. Thank you also to the Bay and Q and to our techs uh, upstairs uh, who helped us with all the technical aspects of the evening. And thank you to all of you for uh, being here online or in person. And just a reminder, when you get up uh, to move around, you can go and visit our table with the different uh, uh, publications we have there or to become members or just uh, to sign up for a newsletter. It is a great honor for me to have uh, uh, chaired this uh, panel and uh, the following discussion. So have a good 